going to be talking about impactful instruction and how to integrate some research-based strategies to move achievement. And before we get started, I always like to ask, if anyone on the call has anything specific you're looking for, because I can try to address those things. A lot of people are like, hey, I'm just here for the ride. <laughs> so that's okay too. But before we get started, is there anything in particular um, those of you on the call are hoping to hear today? Along for the ride. I like it. Then you don't put pressure on me. <laughs> okay, so we'll dive right in. My name is Shauna Stefanczyk. I'm the president and founder of Step Up. Here's my uh, crazy family. And um, I am glad that we're back in school. I'll tell you that. <laughs> but except for everybody's exhausted, uh, but they're having a great year. So to, the objectives of today are, I want us to really talk about, you know, what are research-based strategies from the lens that I'll be talking about them today. And we're looking through research-based strategies and effect size in the power of teacher clarity, student clarity, which also ties into student success criteria. So if you've heard that language, uh, the state has really been talking about student clarity, and we're going to be looking at it through the lens of helping students be very clear on what their success criteria is as we're teaching. And then I'm going to introduce you to something new uh, that I actually created um, Gosh, now it's been five or six years and used with schools. It's an eight-step strategy-focused uh, lesson planning where we're going to put all these parts together. And what I really hone in on is this concept of how can we effectively use our knowledge of misconceptions to help us decide what strategies to use with students. So hang with me. Um, it's a little untraditional approach, uh, but hopefully you will find it beneficial at the end of the call. We're going to give you a link and I will give you a little worksheet that walks through the steps I'm talking about today. So if you like it, you'll have that takeaway. So when we talk about research gurus and research-based strategies, um, here are three that we really anchor our work in. So we've got John Hattie, and I tried to put some of their books that I'm really referencing underneath it, and he's done a lot of work with visible learning. So when we talk about teacher clarity and student clarity, he's the one who's done the research and effect size on that. Uh, the other two, uh, Robert, I want to call him Bob because I feel like we're friends, um, <laughs> but we're totally not. So uh, Robert Marizano, he did the art and science of teaching and a, a ton of other things we're specifically going to be talking about guaranteed and viable curriculum for teacher clarity, the use of proficiency scales, which he's really pioneered. And then you may not be familiar with her, but she's also a pioneer of proficiency scales is Karen Hess. And so uh, she has a different take and she does more learning progressions within her proficiency scales. And this is one of her books that's recently out that it's trending as our state talks about competency-based learning we're really going to need teacher and student clarity. And so she's a founder and researcher in that work. So three great books, if you don't have them, that we're basing those things on today. So we're going to start with this idea of teacher clarity. Again, I've got Hattie up here. And this is his wheel. I like this for a visual graphic of all the research that he's done. And if you look over here to the right of the biggest, it goes biggest effect size to least effective. This idea of collective efficacy is 1.6, which I would argue clarity builds to a collective efficacy. I have to individually believe I have cl or clarity. And it's a group of teachers working together, believing we can do this, we can make impact. That's where our company is always trying to support teachers. Uh, teacher credibility, and then look up here, we've got teacher clarity. And then at one point, I guess it was on his other, um, it talks about, oh, these are teacher clear or teacher effect sizes. And some of his student work, it talks about, well, here it is, self-reported grades. So I'm tying that to also this idea of student clarity. And as we talk about that, we're also going to think about how can students assess themselves? You've heard student assessment capable learner. How do they judge themselves along that continuum where they would know where their grade or their proficiency would be? So here's the research behind teacher clarity. Hattie has done that, that it has a great effect size for teachers and students. So then the question becomes, well, what do st students need clarity about? And I would argue 
standards. Because when we go to Marzano's definition of a guaranteed and viable curriculum, he, um, the state of Missouri has voted on that for us. His definition says the guarantee is that students would have the highest probability of success for um, school. And in our state, they voted on that. And that's our state standards. Um, I always bring this up in calls because I think this is one of the biggest misconceptions in our field is we oftentimes think that our resources are our curriculum, but really the guarantee and the educational equity piece in our state is we should be teaching our standards. And as a state consultant, when I worked for the state department, I found this is the biggest gap is that teachers are teaching really hard on things, but they're not teaching to the level of proficiency that we see on state assessments. And so that's what's been causing that gap. They don't have clarity around what the state says our standards are. So we really need to be um, focusing in on standards and that's what proficiency scales can be around. The viability piece is that we have a plan of how we're actually going to teach those standards. So that's why I'm going to be very standards focused today, because that's what teachers really need clarity about. And here's a quote from him. Um, the number one affecting student achievement is a guaranteed and viable curriculum. So that's the research I'm standing on. We, we have to know those things. Now, post pandemic, our state has also prioritized our standards for us so that if we're wanting clarity about specific standards and we need to weed those down, I would recommend, I think our priorities could then also turn into competencies for the state. Those are the standards that we really want proficiency on. So how do teachers get clarity? And this is where proficiency skills come in. And I put Karen and Robert together on here because they've both done a lot of foundational work. And this is just a quick screenshot to show the idea behind proficiency scales is that the 3.0 is a student is right on grade level, can understand it and is ready to move on. Four, they're an expert, they're confident and I'm sometimes I'm ready for the next level. Approaching a two is I'm not quite there and a one is with assistance, I'm trying to accomplish the things on these twos. So this is the typical proficiency scale model um, that they have um, developed and what we talk about with clarity. And again, the state, uh, the last powerful learning conference was really talking about student clarity. And one of the presenters said, I don't really care about standards. And I wanted to fall out of my chair because we, we should. Um, and teacher clarity precedes student clarity. I'm going Roland Barth on you if you're familiar with his work. Um, you know, he always says teacher learning precedes student learning. Well, I say teacher clarity precedes student clarity. So that's why um, I feel like research really supports this idea of we've got to have proficiency skills for teachers to understand what those standards mean. So what about student clarity then? Once a teacher has a proficiency scale to help reveal that clarity, a student, and you'll hear this language, could use student success criteria. And what that is, is where they've unwrapped, it's essentially that same proficiency scale for a teacher, but in student-friendly language, right? That a student would understand on a continuum, oops, um, I would unwrap the standard in student-friendly language right here for the student to say, here's what it means for you to be proficient. And under the two, here are the things that you should know to get up on that. And they would use this type of checklist to see how could I self-assess myself? Do I think I'm more of a two or I'm more of a three? And I'm going to show you some examples. A another one here where people have taken this a step further, you know, part of you, <laughs> part of me is like, here's just giving a student a checklist, but something really powerful could be, um, and I like this example, here's what our learning goal is, and here's examples of how a teacher's broken that out. If you think you understand nonfiction tests, well, here are the four th things that you should be able to do. Can you look at the diagrams? Can you use the glossary? Can you use the index and contents? Um, I don't really love actually the first and last one because those aren't really measurable, but this idea that you would have clarity with students of looking at a teacher proficiency scale and talking with them about how do you know if you were successful of doing it? What does success really look like? And then I've seen people even turn those into creating an anchor chart with student 
students about, well, how do we know if we're going to be proficient, right? And if they have this on a continuum, they can begin to say, yeah, I'm more of a two, I'm more of a three. Um, we're bringing clarity to them about what the difference of that looks like. This example would be something that a teacher could have laying out, here's what we're working on this month, and here's how you know if you can do it. It's also understand when we talk about or important to understand when we think about um, student clarity is also helping them to understand this idea of the learning pit. And this is a model by James Nottingham. Um, I have his website there. But this idea of students have to have a skill set of understanding what learning takes, right? It's not only do I need to know the targets, I need to understand that you're going to hit this part that learning is harder than I thought. And there's a point where you're going to be in the pit <laughs> and you're going to think I'm not smart, which is American kids, NAEP results show we do all the time. Unlike some of our counterparts, we give up. I'm either born smart or I'm not. And we have to uh, face that misconception with kids right at the beginning of no smart people have a learning pit there's a point where you just really don't understand it and you've got to stick with it and go through that cognitive dissonance and then start to crawl, crawl out of it until you get here. And this idea of having student success criteria of understanding, well, well, first I have to understand text features. And once I understand those, I can begin to compare those to try to find out where to find relevant information. If this makes sense, we're showing them how, um, what learning progressions look like, but really we're trying to teach resiliency and grit here that it is normal for people to not automatically get it. And um, I, I would be remiss not to add this slide because we also have to teach mindset along with the clarity to help students get there. So how do we merge this idea of teacher clarity and student clarity? And I wanna to propose to you this idea of an eight step strategy focused learning protocol. So here's the protocol, which the first four step, first three steps really involve identifying your priority standard, unwrapping it to develop a scale, right? You have to, teachers have to understand what is, what are the big, you can't make a scale on everything. So I'd start with those priority standards. Let's unwrap it to really see what it means. And then we need to make a scale. Then a little formative assessment to know where are we going? What are we expecting students to accomplish? And I put five in yellow because this is really the new thing I'm adding is this idea of identifying misconceptions in order to figure out interventions and strategies. Number seven is where we can kind of get to some success criteria of what are some sticky steps? I What are steps I need to stick in my mind as a learner to help me get to proficiency? And then as a teacher, now that we have teacher and student clarity, what's my method and timeline? So we're going to go over these steps with an example. So here's step one. I'm choosing, this is out my wheelhouse. I usually always choose ELA. So I've got a math concept here. Missouri Learning st Priority Standard is for second grade, find the value of combinations of dollar bills, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies, use the minute money and cent sign. This is a hard skill for second graders for many reasons. If you're a K5, K2 teacher, you're already thinking, oh my gosh, you're bringing in your dollar bills. You're bringing... My mind certainly goes to misconceptions and the fact that kids don't see money anymore, everyone. <laughs> they see credit cards. So um, this is a really important skill, but it can sometimes be difficult to teach. So I think it would definitely be worthy of one for teacher and student clarity. So then now we need to unwrap this standard. And so here's an example of what that might be, um, that you can represent 100 cents in multiple ways, that you can um, represent the values of multiple of the same coin using the symbol sign. I'm not going to go through all of these, but the idea that teachers have to unwrap what are all the different cognitive skills a student is going to need to do in order to master this concept. Okay. And ignore the level two. Oops. We've kind of gone all out here of then how, what would you need to go back to do? How would you, this would be what would come on their lesson planning, right? But when we think about the value combination of dollar bills, you got to know what a dollar is and that it's worth a hundred cents. Um, you have to know, here's a hard one, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. Kids confuse dimes and nickels. 
right? So, um, but really understanding they're going to need to know coin value. They're going to have to understand coins and then they're going to have to know how to skip count. They're going to have to know when you use the dollar sign. Does this make sense? You're unwrapping all those things as a teacher to come up with a scale. Then once you've come up with that scale, you really, we like to use the rule of thumb to have two or three questions at the rigor of that standard to know. So what type of question at the end of this would a student be able to answer? This is where prime uh, proficiency scales really are helpful when you align them to the state because sometimes there is misinterpretation and an assessment question might be just a group of coins as an exit ticket when if we go back to the standard, they have to be using dollar bills as well and be using that cent sign. So teachers really need to have strong conversations about what, what is the rigor? Um, are we going to accept it proficient if they put a cent sign instead of a dollar sign? Some teachers will say, oh, I'd give it to them. Others wouldn't, <laughs> right? You've got to have these conversations about what is a proficient kid really need to do and how are we going to score that? And that's why we say, don't forget the scoring guide. Sometimes the most powerful thing about an assessment is calibrating your teachers of scoring it at the same rigor level, because some people um, might only count it correct if children label the coins with their values, right? Some people, um, the thing is we get off with our grading and calibrating and that can make it at a lower rigor. So we always want to make sure we have a scoring guide as well. So now we get to this idea of once we know what the target is, we have a proficiency scale where we've unwrapped that out as a team. We know what a high level question looks like. Now let's start thinking, what misconceptions do we know kids are gonna have coming into this? And this, I think the power of this is underrated as a PLC. Teachers who've taught before, now this might be harder for your new incoming teachers, but most teachers can readily tell you, oh yeah, I know where they always get tripped up. So we should be using that to front load our planning is what I'm proposing here. So here are some common misconceptions. They can't add unlike coins and they really get confused with dollar bills, right? So when the coin starts flipping around, they might be able to count all dimes or all nickels. But when you throw in a nickel and a dime, because you have to go from counting to tens by fives to 20. So teachers know that that's something we're going to have to have a strategy for. They get the dollar and cent sign confused. And if it's part of the rigor that they have to be using that, that's going to be a misconception we have to address. They may not understand skip counting and they might be getting confused with coin value, right? So here's four common ones going into teaching this money unit that we would want to consider. And so then step five, once you have your teachers, again, I like to work with groups of teachers and have them just list every misconception they know kids typically have on this standard. Now we're gonna go back and think, so thinking especially with this one, what are ways, we, strategies we could use? So if they can't add unlike coins, then we might have them rewrite the money problem in order from least to greatest, right? Or actually it should be greatest to least. You wanna start with the dollar, well, well I'm thinking coins. I'd wanna start with the quarter and then work the way up because it's easier for them to start with 25, then go to tens, then go to five. So we're going to have them re-reign, reorder it. We also, a great strategy is to have them label their coins. If they're getting them confused before they even start counting, go through, find all the quarters, right? 25 above them. Find all the dimes, right? 10 above them. And if they're still struggling, then you might also want to use money touch points, which is where a quarter would have five dots because each one's worth five. A dime would have two dots worth, um, so, you know, five, 10, and a nickel would have five. So if they really can't skip count, they could just count by fives on each of their coins to get there. Now, how did I come up with these strategies? This is where true PLC action comes in. Um, it, unless you're a one man team, but this is where, um, you know, even Googling or finding relying on veteran teachers of what are specific strategies we have used to try to overcome these misconceptions. That's where I came up with these. This was from experience of here's what I tried with students to get there. So misconception gets dollar and cent sign confused. 
<laughs> high school people, Matt, I'm looking at you. They'll they'll never sing a song, but in elementary, we we sing songs about it. <laughs> Right. And we'd probably use verbal cues, go around and I don't know, we make stuff up, but they're going to need these verbal cues. They're going to need to actually do it. Teachers would demonstrate how do we help kids really build that neural pathway to help remember the difference between dollar and cent signs. If they don't remember coin value, um, we could use money touch points, of course, manipulatives. So I'm going to stop here for a second because I have blood a lot with um those of you on the call, questions or thoughts about this idea of, do you think your teachers will be able to come up with misconceptions? And what do you think about this idea of them coming up with targeted strategies? Questions or thoughts about it? Well, I think it's, I think it's great. Um, I'm getting ready to work with a group of teachers. Um, on a specific skill, and I, I, I'm taking notes over here about how I'm going to tie in um, not only this part of it, but also the slides before where it was unwrapping what we need the students to do because I think that's really powerful and gives teachers and students a laser-like focus. So yes, I do think teams of teachers can do this, and how powerful for your new teachers to hear from the veteran teachers what will kids not understand? Because it's shocking sometimes as a new teacher, like, why don't you understand this? And like you've always said, do I just say it louder now or what do I do? Mm -hmm. So yes, powerful. Thoughts or questions or concerns about this approach? In a typical data teams approach, this would come after pre-assessing, you know, this, what I'm proposing here is part of Marzano's original data teams, but the way that I'm flipping it is I would preload this before even teaching, right? To build confidence coming in. I don't need to give you a pre-assessment and waste all these times. I would do this coming in because this type of brainstorm with teachers is really powerful, um, and it might be, it, you know, your team going in that you might need to do some preloading of helping them with strategies. If you have veteran teachers on the team, they can get through this piece. But I found a good old chart paper, having them list the, um, and then I make a T chart and then just align each strategy with the misconception. And let me go to this next one. Here's an example. Then once we look at that, we need to think about, so what anchor charts do we need to use? And so I, some people don't know what uh, money touch points are and some people hate it, but it was a um, godsend to me as a former first grade teacher, because there are some kids who will never be able to go from 25 to 10 to five and skip counting. It's just their minds were not ready for it. So this was a nice concrete way for me to show them a quarter is five nickels. And so this would allow them to just skip count. Um, and I would always teach money. I would front load it. Every time you see a quarter, you're going to put five dots on it. And guess what? By the second week, were there some kids that just got it that I didn't require that strategy of anymore? You bet. But there were certain students every time they would end up being able to drop the dots and just tap on the coin. I think that's a life skill. You could still do that if you needed to in life. Tap that and nobody would even know. Um, but it's this idea that I also want to come into, I think, anchor charts. Sometimes a room will have tons of them, but we're not really using them to anchor learning. I think they're so powerful. But my soapbox with that is every powerful anchor needs to be developed with kids. But I think it's really important for teachers to talk ahead of time. What type of anchors do we want to use so I know where I'm leading my kids and what to create? But then they're owning that as we develop it. Uh, with them, I mean, because I would want things to look better, I'd already have these coins printed off, but I'd be making the dots with them and helping them see. And then that would be anchoring our learning every time. So, Shana, can I interrupt for a second? Yeah. I just wanted to acknowledge Jennifer had um, left in the chat a good resource. Oh, thank um, you, Jennifer. Uh, Cheryl Rose Toby. Toby. Yeah. Okay. So maybe, thank you for bringing that up, Jennifer. When we uh, post this on our network, we'll look that up and put it with it because um, I didn't know about that work. So thank you. That's great. And then 
the so again having great resources like that knowing what to bring into the team meetings um, is helpful as well but then this idea of brainstorming with teachers can help lead to so what are this now that we know these sticking points and misconceptions we have to do and these strategies how do we organize them in a way to help teach this concept and so i have teachers think through what are the it, it, i always try to quantify it in five or less steps to help kids stick in their mind when you go to approaching this how should you do it so this is just my opinion um from being a first grade teacher, when I'm coming to do this concept, I would start with every time we see a money problem, the first thing we're going to do is identify and label our coins. What do I have? I've got, does this make, I put 25 over a quarter and 10, because that's helping me identify. That's the first thing you have to do when you see a money problem. Then you always start with the largest coin to begin counting. That goes with that reordering money. But again, I want, I'm trying to teach kids Sometimes the hardest thing for them, if a problem looks overwhelming, is they don't even have a starting spot. So sticky steps really help students build confidence and of, okay, I know I always have to label coins. I know that I go to the largest. I added three in um, and double check your work <laughs> because in math, I mean, we all do that right as adults. Um, before I send that out, let me double check it. We have to teach them. Now go back and count it again to make sure you get the same value. Now... <laughs> And again, you, you could drop the singing, but this would be my uh, non-math brain. Sing your dollar cent sign to decide and remember which one do I need to make here for my total and then write your total. So I would turn these sticky steps into, um, and I apologize, I didn't do it for this call, they do a visual, but as a team of teachers, they could even make this. If we know these are the five steps we want kids to go through, what would an anchor chart look like, sound like? So now I know when going in with my kids how to create that chart with them. Okay, every time we do money, what's the first thing we do? What's the second thing we do, right? These are the steps you have to always stick in your mind when we're working with money. Hang on, I see we've got a chat thing in here. Um, okay, so... Now, this is a lot of words, so I'm not going to read through it. But the last step is once you've identified misconceptions, you've come up with strategies, we've got our sticky steps. This is when a teacher would come up. So what are my timeline? You know, so the next two weeks, we're going to do touch points. Then I'm going to be doing, um, I'm not going to read all this, but it, teachers have discussions about, well, then how am I really going to unwrap this um, within the next couple of weeks to lay it out? And so that in summary is, whoops, sorry, I'm getting slide. Step eight. So we've led through, I really just wanted you to see how you pair to uh, teacher and student proficiency skills and add this idea of helping teachers. And again, this is a PLC process to use with them. My misconceptions to come up with strategies, which would lead to sticky steps and anchor charts to use with kids which would then impact the timeline or my resources. What out of my resource am I going to really stick to and teach? What do I need to supplement based on what I know um, to meet that standard? And then I just want to close with this. Why am I talking about tier one today? Um, because I feel most of our schools now have a inverted pyramid, right? Most of our kids, more kids are in tier three and two, or at least it has been in urban where Sue and I, Val and I have worked most of it. But this idea and the reason I love this strategy, if you, the more we focus on tier one and we make that solid and tight, the less kids we have in tier two and three. So when you really analyze um, this process, I used a lot of strategies that I was using with tier two and tier three kids. But what I'm doing is I'm flipping that up front and I'm introducing it to everyone in tier one. I'm making my tier one tight, tight, tight. So then I can now drop off some of those strategies for kids that don't need it. But I'm not waiting till three weeks into instruction to introduce a good strategy to struggling learners. I'm doing it right up front. And I think that is the power of how we close the gap is that we understand the rigor and expectations, but we start teaching really strong strategies first in tier one. And so, um, and again, having proficiency scales, that's why I have a picture 
one of those right up front is powerful because we're being really clear with what the rigor of that is up front so we don't accidentally teach it below uh, level. So in summary, teacher clarity is pivotal. We have to know our standards and what the state says is proficient. Proficiency sales can provide that clarity, but student success criteria and anchor charts can provide that student clarity that where we break it up. And then following this process that I just showed with you um, can be really helpful in teachers seeing how to merge those together and come up with specific strategies. The last thing I want to close with is that vertical progressions are powerful. So I wanted to show you this K through two one on time and money. So look at K one, the bolded are uh, priority standards shows up nowhere in kindergarten first is priority and it hits in second. So it's important for math for even your kindergarten and first grade teachers, they each have a standard for money. And if we're not making that a priority, um, we so sometimes there's priorities off of the DESE recommended list. This is a very difficult skill and it's making it hard for second grade teachers if they don't have that support. Um, but it also helps with higher level scaffolding of second grade teachers to know if my kids can't do this, what was the first grade skill and then what was the kindergarten skill. But vertical conversations around these big topics are important as well. Um, Again, sample proficiency scales. Uh, this is not a Karen Hess, uh, Bob Marzano scale. It's a Shauna Stefanczyk at Step Up Consulting one. But I think what's really powerful is when you add this right-hand side for teachers and include examples of this is what proficiency looks like. This is when scales can really become powerful for teachers. And then giving them ideas and videos and anchor charts um, I didn't add all those. It can be really helpful. So as if you're concerned about working on proficiency scales, um, know we have that available, but also um, these creative ways where adding this assessment side is very powerful. And then here's an example of what a student scale would look like. Um, using this level two and three, I, you could turn that into an anchor or progression for a student to really say, where am I on this continuum? Um, yep. And so we have those tools. If you're interested in looking at those, that's why we're very passionate about student and teacher clarity at our company because it's powerful. And I'm going to part you with Hattie, this idea of collective efficacy, whether you think you can or you can't, you're right for the teacher and the student. So um, I hope that we gave you some new knowledge um, and thank you for your time on the call. Val, I'll have you stop the recording and then I can answer any questions if anybody has one.